And the theme for this morning is the mark of reality. There's three headings, okay, just in case you missed them. The peace from a promised past, peace at a price for the present, I'm in my peace today, and peace for the future. Okay, so Luke chapter 2, verses 21 through 35, and it's a story of Jesus being presented at the temple. Be aware that this is over a period of time this happened, okay? We got the eighth day, and then we got 40 days later, okay? So it's over a period of time, five, six weeks, okay? On the eighth day, when it was time to circumcise him, he was named Jesus, the name the angel had given him before he'd been conceived. When the time of their purification, according to the law of Moses, had been completed, Joseph and Mary took, took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as it's written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord, and to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon, who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon looked, took him in his arms, and he praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you've promised, you now dismiss your servant in peace, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of, of all people, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. The child's father and mother marveled at what was being said to him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to his mother, Mary his mother, This child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be spoken against, so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. Amen. And God will bless the reading of his, his word. An unusual reading because it starts on a high note and it sort of gets tough, doesn't it? But life is like that, isn't it? We give impressions. You know, the Tannoy announcement, true story, London Underground in a hard tone over the Tannoy camp. So with the person begging on the station steps, please leave the station. London Transport does not allow begging on these premises. Next announcement, bing bong. London Transport would like to wish all their customers a very Merry Christmas and a happy and prosperous New Year. Bing bong. Would the person on the station steps please leave immediately? You can imagine what goes on. And this is the true story and reflects the stark reality of Christmas time and the reality actually of the first Christmas as well. There was poverty. There was political oppression, there was high taxation, there was homelessness. In fact, the world was in a similar state as it is today, except they didn't have Next and Little Woods and Debenhams and all the rest of it to go along with it. And I mentioned earlier about walking round, seeing people with their shopping bags, you know, pleased with their purchases, and there's nothing intrinsically wrong with that. We all like to get something new, don't we? But when, when you could see those young people, my heart went out to them. I just wanted to go and put my arms in around them and just take them home. But I knew that there was more to the picture than that. There was hurt there. You could see that in their faces. You could see they were trapped. And like caged animals, they were so used to the bars that they didn't see freedom. They could see nothing beyond it. And so actually, by going in and picking them up and taking them home, would have probably done them no good at all. Apart from the fact they thought they were just going to get something for nothing. You know, a number of years ago, I was an advert on telly that said for every homeless pe person, there's a 600 pro empty properties in the UK. In February of this year, there was a report. It says more than 11 million homes lie empty across Europe, enough to house all the continent's homeless twice over. According to, to figures collated by The Guardian from across the EU, in Spain, more than 3.4 million homes lie vacant. In excess of 2 million homes are empty in each of France and Italy. 1.8 million in Germany and more than 700,000 in the UK. Doesn't change much, does it, the world? You see, the advent of Jesus Christ coming into the world is, of course, a joyful occasion. It necessitates celebration. 
It tells of a God who cares and reaches out to lost humanity with the express purpose of reconciliation. And encapsulated in all of this, we experience one who understands the need of all, who has an equal regard for each one of us. And in spite of all those quirks we might have, the personalities, the bad habits, our strengths and our weaknesses, whether we've got a home or not, God cares for us. And here again, we have this beautiful picture of grace that God wraps himself around us, covering over a multitude of sin. All that remains for us to do is to see it and then receive it. And that's probably the biggest challenge of all for every person, isn't it? And I'm not just talking about the non-believer, I'm talking about the believer as well, because, you know, we've all been there. If you're a believer today, you've been to that point where you've received Jesus as your saviour and you're glad you made that step. Do you remember the struggle leading up to it? Do you remember that inner turmoil as you were asking all those questions? Then you remember that great step, and that's the bit we focus on. But then as we seem to go on, and we get further and further away with it, we talk about, oh, what it was like and the joy that I had. But actually, we kind of let go, safe in the knowledge that we are saved, but then actually, we don't really want to hear what God wants us to do next because actually we've got to go through that again, haven't we? Well, we've got to ask those inner questions. We've got to face those inner struggles. We've got to take that step of faith. But you know, God gives us enough light for the next step and then we have to take one step. He's not going to tell us what's at the end of the road. We've just got to take one at a time. That's the challenge of it. Well, first heading. Peace from a promised past. Look at verse 21. On the eighth day, when it was time to circumcise him, he was named Jesus. The name the angel had given him before he'd been conceived. When the time of their purification, according to the law of Moses, had been completed, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it's written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord. A pair of doves or two young pigeons. Now, there were three regulations that they had to follow. First of all, they had to get the child sacrificed. Oh, sermon, circumcised, sorry. That, that, that came later. That's Easter. Sorry, we're at Christmas. Okay, they had to get the child circumcised. Now, the reason that there was a number of things that happened in here. For the first seven days after birth, the woman is regarded as unclean if she's given birth normally, okay? So she enters into a time, I won't tell you the word, but there is a word for it, okay? So there's seven days that she can't be presented at the table, at the, at the temple because she's regarded as unclean, okay? But also a child, so you can see how God works it. So there's seven days, okay? Perfect number. And then day eight, the child is circumcised. There's a very good physiological reason why the baby is, is circumcised on the eight days. Does anyone know why? Do you know why? Exactly, exactly. You don't start clotting. Your blood doesn't start clotting until the eighth day. So there's good reason for it. See, God's got it all in hand. Okay, so secondly, there was to be purification of the mother uh, after childbirth. And of course, Joseph as well, because he was present for the childbirth. And that would happen after a period of 40 days. So it's a long period of time, and we can only assume what went on in those 40, 40 days. Um, and it must have been a difficult time because they were stuck in that place away from home all that time. So he may have got work. We don't know. And third, there was the dedication of the child. Now, this was in keeping with the law of Moses. And that goes right back to the Exodus, time of the Exodus, when the angel of the Lord killed the firstborn of Egypt, but spared the firstborn of Israel. So the firstborn son is regarded is particularly important and belonging to the Lord. Okay, there is another reason that goes, um, that talks about before the Levites had been chosen, the, the, the oldest son was chosen to serve as a priest of the family after the father's death. So it had a priestly role as well. So, that, so the, the son was exempt from temple duties, but that's a, another aside, right? So this purification, right, required the sacrifice of a lamb and a pigeon, but in cases of hardship, two pigeons or doves would suffice. And in case of Mary and Joseph, of course, the, the cheaper option was taken, which actually reflects that they were very poor people, didn't have a lot materially, but there was provision made for them. 
They were poor people, but they were devout people. They wanted to do the right thing, and so they were serious in their religion. Circumcision, of course, would mark the baby as a member of the covenant people, and when he was of age, he would be encouraged to pursue the obedience to the law and to be a follower of God like his parents. Now, you might say, well, that's pretty academic, considering, considering what Mary and Joseph have been through. But actually, you know, if you get into the, into the ancient Near Eastern mind, they think different to we do, the way we do. They think big picture. Okay, we're very linear, very Greek. A goes to B goes to C equals D. They see things big picture, okay? So actually, they would see all these things as signs, but they really wouldn't get it at this stage, okay? We've got the benefit of hindsight, but they wouldn't really get it all. But look at verses 25 through 32. Now, there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel important phrase, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he wouldn't die before he seen the Lord's Christ. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. When the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what was custom of the law, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God. And he said, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all your people, a life for revelation to the Gentiles and for the glory of your people, Israel. This is a beautiful and a really moving scene. This old man in the twilight of his years with this new baby in his arms. There's something about that picture, isn't there? There's the new and the old. It's interesting, I saw a, a, a fascinating picture last night. It was a, on Facebook, it, was, it comes on one of my army sites, and uh, it was a, char, a chap who was an ex uh, Royal Engineer, and um, he was dying, and his last wish was to hold his newborn baby in his arms. And that's what he did, and there was this wonderful picture of him with his baby in his arms. He was naked from the waist up, so was the baby. With nothing you come into this world, with nothing you go out. There was something raw about it, but there was something really beautiful about this whole picture. There was a beginning, and there was an ending, and there was an ending, and there was a beginning. And this is what we're seeing here. Having been told by the Spirit that he wouldn't die before he'd seen the Messiah. Now, for him, a disciple of God, believing God's promise for all this time, and now look... Receiving this promise, it wasn't just the greatest Christmas present he'd ever have. This was the consolation of Israel. And verse 25, actually, a very important verse, because it refers to the messianic age that Simeon, along with so many others, were looking forward to. This was the one who would deliver the nation from the rule of Rome. The one who would establish them again as a nation. They were thinking in the form of King David. This was a sign from way back in the Old Testament. This was the kingdom of rock that was spoken about in Daniel chapter 2. And this is the kingdom that we see in Revelation 11 where he said the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ and he will reign forever and ever. This is fantastic stuff. The history of the nation you see is so important to these people because it speaks of the revelation of God and his dealings with them. This, for Simeon, for these people, was their identity. It was their law. It was their religious practices. And all the promises of God that are made, they were all bound up in it. Everything was here in his arms. Without it, without their history, they were nothing. They were lost. They were without hope. From Abraham through to the Exodus, being led by Moses to freedom. And it was a difficult time in the wilderness, but eventually they'd arrived in the land that God had promised. Then looking back on the nation and how it became become great, the great conquering leader, King David. The prosperous years of King Solomon. And like many kingdoms, what happened? They'd gone into gradual demise. And eventually the invasion by the Babylonians twice. How they were released and returned home by the Persian king Cyrus, who allowed them to resettle Jerusalem. We talked about that in Nehemiah, haven't we? They resettled and rebuilt their nation. All this happened under the constant promise of deliverance. All the time they were looking for this Messiah, this one who would bring out, and here he was. 
All of this under the direction of God who will bring back these wonderful times. The nation great, God honoured and evident among his people. At least that was their take on it. Imagine what it must have been like for Simeon. He's holding his babe in his arms and he's, th he's, ring he's computing all of this stuff. All his history has gone like that to that. Everything is a fulfilment. But there's a problem. I don't know if you see it. There's a problem with that viewpoint, isn't there? Do you see how they were constantly looking back the way? Look how we used to be. So much so that they weren't really looking forward. And so consequently, they were just existing and holding on to any little bit of encouragement they could to, to bolster up their confidence for just another day. These people were hanging on by their fingernails spiritually. And it was great to have the Messiah there. Everything had been fulfilled. But for Simeon, although he was probably going to die shortly afterwards and he was going to be in God's presence, actually for him and for so many others, it was just going to be another era of a King David and a King Solomon and we were being great and prosperous again and we were going to know God's presence with us. That was enough almost. But actually Jesus was ushering in something totally different. Now I don't know about you, but I can see the Christian church doing exactly the same thing. And instead of rejoicing in all the good things that have happened in the past, but straining towards what God has got for our immediate future, we spend all our time either trying to recreate that which was, that was in the past, and we try to reinvent the wheel by some kind of new expression, rather than realising that we are the children of God and that we are here to build this kingdom in the now with all the colour and with all the creativity that God has given to us. We are unique. We don't need a design that's been formed somewhere else. We are to extend God's kingdom here in Beacon Loft and we are the people to do it. Why? Because we're the best ones for the job. Now we don't know how long it was for Simeon. We don't know how long ago we've been told about this. But I just want you to picture this old man looking forward to the moment when the promise will be fulfilled. What must it have been like when God first spoke to him? Have you ever thought about that? And he waited all this time. And I wonder if he doubted whether it was actually going to happen. And now here he stands with the second person of the Trinity in his arms. Is it any wonder he burst into a song? Sovereign Lord, you've promised. Just as you promised, and now dismiss your servant in peace, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you prepared in the sight of all your people. You know, he's drawing on the prophecy of Isaiah chapters 43 to 55. This great revelation of God was greater than the nation itself. His truth, his love was going to be made known to the world. And that meant to the whole, the non-Jewish world, the whole world. You know, how can an encounter with the living God ever fail to make an impact on you? Have you been the same since you met Jesus? I haven't got over it yet. Consider for a moment the scene. There were others who had seen the child with his parents. There have been the shepherds, there have been the wise men, or the nativity scene. Do you think they saw God's salvation? I don't think so. We can't judge these folk for that. But what they do is remind us of so many people who attend worship services but never actually see anything. It's not that they're not good, sincere people. Maybe just that they're really not sure what they're looking for. The feel and the fellowship is good. The music's all right. Even what the preacher says to a point is acceptable. But what am I meant to see? Well, let me tell you, no one is to blame. It's often just the way it is. But here we have in this passage an answer. We have an answer in Simeon. Because here was a man who saw with the eye of faith just what God wanted him to see. And in trusting God and believing his promise, this experience filled every recess of his heart and lifted him from all the doubts and caused a great joy and this incredible peace in his heart. You know, if I was a gambling man, I would say it was better than winning the lottery. Did anyone hear that soundtrack on, on Facebook? There was a little clip they, they want someone had done a scratch card and 
what the girl phoned him and they record all the messages, you know. And she said, hello. And she said to him, um, um, he said, oh, yeah, he said, uh, I can confirm you've won a million pounds. Why you should have had this bloke go. It was great to hear. And he told this girl how much he loved her, you know. Mind you, I think I'll probably say the same. But the fact is, you know, it was fulfilling for the minute. But for Simeon, this was so much more. See, Dean, it's peace from a promised past, isn't it? All that promise that was there, and now it's here. But there's peace at a price for the present as well. You see, the incarnation was a costly affair. It was costly for God because he had to become human and endure the limitations of mortality. He divested himself, didn't he? But for the people, the price of freedom was high as well. King Herod was frightened of the competition, so he took steps to prevent any change in his ambition. And so what did he do? Every child who's two and under, he had them murdered in the surrounding area. And then believing that he changed God's plan, he just carried on the way that he also always did. But nothing changes in the world. These horrors of infanticide are just as real today. Bosnia, Kosovo, Rwanda, Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, all the results of the ambition of evil men, but they will fall. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said to him. That kind of confirms the fact that they didn't get the complete picture. In spite of the fact they've met angels, in spite of the fact they've been visited in their dreams, in spite of the fact all these strange people have come to visit them, in spite of the fact that they knew that this was to be the child of God, they really didn't get it all. They marveled not because they heard anything new. They marveled because the words caused them to see the truth in a new way. And we must remember for Mary and Joseph, this was a journey for them as well. Look at verse 34. Then Simeon blessed them and said to, his, to Mary, his mother, This child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against, so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed. And a sword will pierce your heart too. That must have been a real blow for Mary, you know. Glad that she'd had the baby, glad that they were surviving, glad that they were able to do everything required by the law, glad that they got him circumcised, glad that she was now purified so they'd go back to worship. Glad they were in this place, chuffed to bits that this man had come out and said, acknowledged everything. So actually, someone else sees it as well, and then she says, Ah, oh, but a sword's going to pierce your heart. You don't want to hear what the end of life's going to be at the beginning, do you? This child Jesus will bring truth to light. He's the light of the world, and in doing so, every person who comes into contact with him will have conflict in their heart, causing a crisis of the decision. Because Jesus precipitates a centrally important movement in one's life, either towards God or away from God. And as much as we may wish to join the name of Jesus only to the positive things or the satisfying things and the blessed things in life, the inescapable fact is that anyone who turns on light will create shadows. And this is no easy position to be in. This is a decision of rising or falling, life or death. And then the added pressure is that how others feel doesn't even affect it. You've got to live it for yourself. He will be a sign. You see, a sign is that which challenges attention and is full of significant meaning. Signs are intended to calm controversy and to exclude contradiction. And we know that there's a lot of that about. But it's interesting that Jesus provokes both, doesn't he? You know, during his time on earth, he was accused of being a deceiver. He was even accused of being a demonic. Today, he's accused of the same have you read some of the quotes that come out from people's mouths on some of these chat rooms? You ever, you ever read the Yahoo News? I don't know if you've got your homepage. You go to Yahoo News, scroll down, someone makes some comment, you know, and then you, everyone's comments underneath. Some of the bizarre stuff that comes out of people's mouths. But, you know, that's the real world we live in. And Jesus has been misrepresented and slandered constantly. But actually, he remains constant 
And why was he accused of these things? Because sinful humanity prefers living in the shadows and fears the exposure of the light. You know, we reveal our true nature by our attitude towards Christ. Those who are sincere are actually drawn to him, but those who prefer their own desires and ambition are just repelled from him. And, uh, you know, <coughs> what we're seeing here is not just dealing with all those difficulties and that turmoil and that decision-making 